don't put the history down, it gets lost. So uh, let me say two quick things, and then we'll start. And Ed Hooks will start us off. But this Stanley Women's is the uh, historian of the First Baptist Church of America, and uh, he spent 11 years collecting the history of the black members. And when you look at it, it doesn't look phenomenal, but it is. William J. Brown's mother is here, and when she entered that church in 1812, and blah, 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 and she died out of it, they didn't kick her out, she died. It's the most fascinating piece of evidence of blacks in one of the most important churches in America. Good morning, and welcome to St. Stephen's. And in welcoming you here, I am welcoming you to my home. This has been my home parish since I've been a very little one. Yeah, I've been all over some other places, but this has been my home. And this morning, as Ray had said, you're going to hear remembrances of uh, St. Augustine's Chapel, Church of the Savior, St. John's Cathedral. Some of the speakers who will uh, share their memories will mention St. Stephen's. <clears throat> that is because St. Stephen's was founded in 1839. And as Father Alexander has already said, it was uh, a fully integrated parish at a time when you did not find integrated parishes. Okay. I went to the Church of the Savior as a very little person, and I loved that church, and I loved Father Will Brown. And um, I was, I don't want to say this, I was kind of disheartened when we had to move down the street down the street to St. John's. We went to St. John's in the, the room in the back, I guess it's a chapel in the back of the church. And um, I was, I had made my first communion there, and um, oh, just a whole lot of things. But it was, um, I don't know who the, the pastor was at the time or who instigated us moving from the back of the church to the front of the church. Mm. Um, I still wish there was a Church of the Savior. That Kenneth Higginbotham, that was just recently mentioned, was a wonderful pastor. Pastor was very young, and um, do you remember him? And he, all of the ladies used to like giggle. I <laughs> wonder what they were laughing at. There was, there was nothing funny, except maybe that he was young. But it was a very beautiful. Nice church. Father, we always had, Father Moore Brown was, oh God, if you didn't know him and I never went to church, you know, he was an exceptional priest. I mean, he was absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, there was Bobby Bailey and Craig Wilson and Paul, <coughs> you know, there and Ted Fleming and we all, they were all acolytes and um, very, you know, they would swing the incense and like this, like around and around and around, you know. And he can explain the uh, history of the Church of the Savior. As has been mentioned, it started as St. Augustine's Mission <clears throat> uh, on October 5th, 1913. And it, the person, the major person responsible for the starting of the church was the Right Reverend James D. Wolf Perry. Uh, and for the first several years, the church was served by substitute ministers uh, and Bishop Perry himself. My mother said she was baptized by Bishop Perry. Uh, Father Moore Brown did, was not involved in it at that time. Uh, Father Moore Brown came here as a Methodist minister uh, in 1914 and began his ministry in Providence at Bethel AME. But during the next couple of years, he became interested in becoming an Episcopal priest and worked with Bishop Perry to do that. Finally, in 1917, after uh, St. Augustine's mission was moved to the church at the corner of uh, Transit and Benefit, and that, by the way, was the original St. Stephen's yeah. Church. <clears throat> One question I have is, what happened to the Church of the Savior that was established in the 1860s. 
that used to be in that building. I didn't I say hear you say that that was merged to form St. Martin's? No, you didn't hear me say that. Really? That is correct. It is correct. Yeah. Okay, so the building was vacant in uh, 1917, and when St. Augustine's mission moved there, they were asked to assume that name because that was the name of that building, and uh, there was a lady, uh, Mrs. Vendon, who had given money to establish the original Church of the Savior, and they wanted to continue the use of that name because that was a uh, part of her, uh, an agreement that they had with her. Well, the Church of the Savior stayed there until 1932, when during the Depression, the diocese sold the building to the Bacher players. In the 1940s, a house and a vacant lot next to it were purchased on North Main Street, a few lots north of Oney Street. And the house was built back into the hill, and you can see it in one of the uh, pictures over here. Uh, the house had a store on the ground floor, and the main floor was at the second level. Uh, that's where we had our Sunday school classes. I think Ann was in my Sunday school class at that time, yeah, in the 1940s. <laughs> we date go back a long way. I became the rector at Ascension Wakefield. Fra Father Phillips, he was somewhat of a curmudgeon and thought that the Benedictus that we sang sounded too much like rock and roll. Uh, throughout its existence, uh, the Church of the Savior had an Anglo-Catholic ceremonial, and they usually sang, Welcome, Happy Morning, as the procession with Easter. That's all I have to say. Thank you. The Church of the Savior closed, and they went to St. John's? Yes. Tell us about it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't involved in making that decision. I don't agree, didn't agree with it at the time. Uh, I was the organist towards the end. I remember Janice Rawlings did that during the 56-57 uh, season. I did it 55-56, and then I came back and did it the rest of the time. It was a small organ that was electric, didn't have foot pedals, and it was easy to play. Uh, at the final service, Bishop Higgins wanted us to march down the hill in procession. And this was January. I thought it was kind of a silly thing to do. I didn't want to do it. But Bishop Higgins insisted that I be in it. And I brought up the rear of the procession down the hill. Uh, and to keep me involved in church, they asked me to, to sing in the choir at St. John's. I could carry a tune. Mm -hmm. I could read music. I do not have a good singing voice. <laughs> then I went off to graduate school in 1960 and occasionally finished, visited after that. But just <clears throat> thinking about Easter at Church of the Savior brings back a lot of memories. So, yeah. A lot of um, the time that you were talking about with the clergy, you were at cathedral, at the cathedral using the chapel. <clears throat> okay, uh, <clears throat> okay, what? Father Mar Brown began in 1917 and served until 1950. And that included the time at uh, Benefit and Transit Street, Broadway, the Cathedral Chapel, and then finally the new church. He introduced, he started us off at the new church. And uh, <clears throat> after that he retired. And Father Holly came. Uh, <clears throat> I was confirmed again with Ann. We were in the same confirmation class, I believe, uh, by Bishop Bennett. And uh, then I went to the Cathedral of St. John myself, my mother and oldest there. And I came back as an organist in 55. And you talked about how nice it was to come through the front door of the cathedral as opposed to when he was christened. And he had to come through the back door to go to the chapel to be christened in the 40s. So, but I'd been at the cathedral since the 60s, and we just uh, suspended services for the time being, hopefully, and we'll go back again soon. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, any of you at the cathedral remember Lyman Mason, the custodian? Yeah. 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 Well, he was my dad. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. And uh, he loved the place. Mm. And 
he lived way out in Cumberland, and you know, we'd say to him, look, it's snowing, you know, you don't have to go today. <laughs> and he'd get in the car and he'd be down there. So both, and my mother did things too at the yes, cathedral. Yes, they yes. both loved it, so I just wanted to, to add that. They used to have a uh, parish picnic at your house in the summer. They used to host a parish picnic at your house in the summer. <laughs> I must go. I must have been to the west someplace. Yeah, yeah, but they used to they used to have a picnic, and the Simmons used to have a picnic. Uh, Fred and Millie Simmons. They used to have a picnic. Tell us the years. Probably it had to be in the '60s. I to say. Yeah. Arriving here, I was doing research on something called ESCU, Episcopal Society for Cultural and Racial Unity. It evolved during the Civil Rights Movement, started in New England, in New Hampshire actually, by an Atlanta uh, cleric. And they had chapters throughout New England. And uh, they had a very strong chapter in Massachusetts. Uh, I've forgotten the, the bishop in Massachusetts who was very influential. Uh, they had a very strong chapter in Connecticut and a so-so chapter here in Rhode Island even though there was this prominent Rhode Islander who got arrested in St. Petersburg, Florida um, from a prominent family for an elderly woman for sitting in, in the restaurant. Um, in the course of doing my research, I interviewed Mr. Williamson, Mr. Fred Williamson, and Mr. Cleon Harvey, and there was another person in the interview. It was, in, it was at the cathedral as a woman. And they talked about their experiences growing up as Episcopalians in Rhode Island. They talked about being, growing up as black people, first of all, in Rhode Island, which was interesting. Uh, but they also talked about uh, growing up uh, as Episcopalians. And I remember there were, and being in escrow, because what the escrow members in Rhode Island would do, they would visit churches every Sunday and try to bring in members. It was a group dedicated to integration of American society. And they supported all the efforts of King and others. And I'm a member of St. Martin's Church. And I remember this vividly. Mr. Harvey talking about their group going to St. Martin's. And after the coffee hour, they'd arranged to meet uh, congregants of St. Martin's. And what they did with the S group people is they put them in one room, and all of the white parishioners went to coffee hour in another room. They, so they never got a chance to meet them and talk to them. And I, it, I'm smiling, but at the time he told the story, tears welled up in his eyes. And this is like 1994, 95 or something, and this must have happened 30 some years ago. But the the visceral pain of these people treating them like that, and he must have been in his 80s, I guess, at that point, was still felt there. That was one story. So these, these people had these wonderful stories uh, about being Episcopalian, black Episcopalians, and, and the church, uh, uh, Church of Our Savior. They, they talked about there were pews that the family sat in all the time, and there was this sense of community that they had. And this one woman was really angry about this whole marching in hand in hand and this unilateral decision to dissolve their church. And she was like still angry. And, and again, that to me was like, this is 30 or 40 years ago, but she had been born and reared in this church and her family had this connection to this church. Um, so I got early arriving here a sense of the black people. Southern school. churches are all together different because they were segregated. Specifically, uh, here it was a little bit different. So, when the transition occurred from the Church of the Savior to St. John, there was a separation within the congregation. You could see blacks on one side, see whites on the other side. All light-skinned people on one side, darker-skinned people on the other <laughs> side. So, <laughs> we noticed that the gentleman who was deceased now, Cleon Harvey, he. Uh, mentioned that to me and I, I said, that's true. So what we decided to do then was to kind of mix things up 
as much as we possibly can. So we started to sort of integrate within very quietly, and we started to move people to other sections of the church. So I became a sort of an usher, so we tried to usher people in to sort of mix in. So people did that very quietly. And um, we did have some people that left St. John because there was a color or color church merging in with St. John. And we do have that, unfortunately, in some of the Episcopal Church. She was a very important person. My mother went to St. John around. She came up here in 1942. And uh, all Southern women would come north, you know, so they could make more money up here and then send the money back home so they could have it for the children. So she went to St. John, and the usher said, your service is in the back. So she left, didn't go back. So that was kind of sensitive. You know, she grew up as an Episcopalian, because in the South we had Episcopal schools, and uh, they were taught by the nuns, because the nuns were very prevalent in the Episcopal Church. And uh, it was, uh, she took uh, classes there and graduated and everything. So that was one of my sensitivities. So now, at present, uh, I think we have 52 or so churches in the diocese, and I've attended all 32 since the last Sunday. I find <laughs> and, and after the first five, it got to be interesting. And I said, well, <laughs> churches are like a family, all of them whether they're Baptist, Episcopalian, or whatever. And uh, you, you soon find that out. I quit the Methodist Church over the Vietnam War. They fired the bishop and our minister for being against the war in Vietnam. And I thought, what a church. Uh, I don't want to be a member of it anymore. And the Episcopal Church in Detroit, uh, Christ Church, which I joined, I joined because they had a soup kitchen. It was a Lebanese soup kitchen. It was kind of cool. <laughs> they created it in the 1930s for uh, Lebanese coming to Detroit. And uh, it was always for somebody. So whatever group was new, they kind of make it the kitchen for those folks. And uh, so I thought any church that has a real soup kitchen, I'm not talking about a little, they had a seven day a week soup kitchen. And, uh, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. That's how I got to be an Episcopalian. Well, I had to go to the classes too, but anyway, that's why I decided to be in Newport. We go uh, uh, to Trinity almost every Christmas in Newport, and the very first time I ever went, it was very awkward for me. You look up and you see the Pells on the wall and the light with the plaques, and you know, you say, wow, that's cool, Claiborne Pell's father, grandfather, whatever. And then, unfortunately for me, I study slavery. I know the 40 families in Rhode Island who were slavers. And seven or eight of them are on the walls of Trinity. I'm talking about big slavers, uh, bigger than the Browns. And there you are in the, in, the, in the church in prayer. And every time you turn your head, you're looking at a plaque put up by a slaver who helped to build that church. And so I always had mixed views about the Episcopal Church. I love being an Episcopalian. Every once in a while, I, I get my little study materials out from when I was a teenager. I got them out last night to refresh myself. And I go through the pages and try to learn. Because in the beginning, and I'll stop uh, Ed in one minute, but when I, I was a, a Baptist child, Matthew, Luke, and John, we were fabulous religion, because you learn the Bible. And so um, it's a different experience as an adult than an Episcopalian. And it's complicated. But I was not bad mouthing Trinity Church for having been built by slavers, because most of America was built by slavers in 1862. St. Stephen's yeah. had already merged with Christ Episcopal Church. Christ Episcopal Church was founded, uh, St. Stephen's was actually founded in 1837. They built their first edifice in 1839. They got their incorporation because churches had to be incorporated uh, from the state legislature in October of 1839. About the same time, about the same time, Christ Episcopal Church, which was the Black Episcopal Church, was founded, and its building was at the corner 
of Union and Fountain Streets in Providence, which would be approximately across the street from, the, from today's Providence Journal Company. And um, that church, the uh, Christ Church, of course, had its own problems with surviving financially. Um, Christ Church uh, also, uh, at that time, when we moved to about three years forward, 18, 1842, the members of Christ Church, the black community, they were supporters of the uh, government, the Rhode Island state government. And of course, uh, this goes into Doors War and the people's government versus the state government. And, uh, and as a result of all of this, uh, blacks who had been disenfranchised earlier got their right to vote in the government and the state government in, well, in the Episcopal Church in um, acknowledging that, then accepted Christ Episcopal Church into the Episcopal that And Al Alexander Crummel from New York came. Now, Alexander Crummel was a um, classmate of uh, George Downing and uh, they had gone to school together and everything. But Alexander Crummel got here first. In fact, there are some people that say it's because Alexander Crummel was here that George Downing eventually came here and, of course, opened up his businesses and everything. Hmm. But at any rate, uh, Christ Church could not support itself. A little bit later on, we see during the late uh, 1840s, early 1850s. We don't know exactly when, but we know the two churches had merged. And whether the diocese said, Christ Church, you merge with St. Stephen's, which is a new church, or not, we don't know. We just know that they were together. So that made us an integrated body. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come together and to share stories of the roads, many roads that we have traveled. We ask you to bless us and make us one people in your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Be very happy is the uh, not only the, the history of the parish, which uh, was, uh, if it's not already been mentioned, one of the first uh, racially integrated Episcopal parishes in the country. I think about the third and the fourth, uh, and certainly the first here in Rhode Island, um, but also the continuing uh, participation of people from uh, all uh, backgrounds, ethnic groups, uh, and um, uh, nationalities, uh, classes in the, uh, in the life of the... I just wanted to say how fascinating that I could be in Providence from 1968 and have to come by this building multiple times on my way to wherever I was going. And I never knew what went on here until last year. And Ramona?